Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our today's seminar uh, speaker, Professor Mohammad uh, Naragi uh, from Texas A&M University, Department of Aerospace uh, Engineering. Uh, so uh, Mohammad uh, uh, received his PhD in 2009 from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in Aerospace Engineering. Uh, he worked on uh, nanomechanics and applications of uh, uh, MEM sensors uh, to investigate mechanical behavior of soft uh, fibrous uh, materials. Uh, and uh, following his PhD, he did a postdoc uh, at Northwestern University, I believe in mechanical engineering, okay. yeah, it was mechanical engineering this time. And in 2012, he joined uh, Texas A&M University Aerospace Engineering Department as an assistant professor and was promoted to uh, associate pro professor in 2018 and uh, to associate department head sometimes uh, after uh, that. Uh, so uh, today is going to be talking about electrifications of airplanes, challenges, and uh, opportunities. Uh, and uh, we'll soon give the floor to Professor Naragi. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so um, uh, I've been meeting many, many of the colleagues here, and uh, I'm, I'm really impressed and thanks for, for the opportunity to uh, get engaged uh, with, um, with you all. Uh, so um, today, um, as Tron said, I'm going to talk about how we can have the airplane, the equivalent airplane uh, of, a, of a Tesla car an airplane that runs on batteries. What are the challenges and what are the opportunities? But the way I got into this research, uh, if you look at here, nanostructured materials lab, that's the lab I, I have in, in Texas A&M. And there we make nanomaterials and we break them and we see how they behave. Um, the reason I, the way I got into this from here was uh, pretty much a solution that was looking for a problem. And the problem we found was uh, in uh, the desire to make uh, array, uh, airplanes run on batteries. Uh, there are multiple reasons we would want to do that, including reducing greenhouse gas emissions from uh, aerospace industry. But before I, oops, oops, okay. Before I get into uh, the main bulk of the talk, you know, life is not fair. Uh, these are the people who did the all the job. The three, uh, two of them graduated, and Jacob will will graduate. Uh, will actually defend his thesis PhD thesis next, uh, actually in two weeks. So, and uh, we're getting the credit for the job that they did. And most of the work in here in in this presentation has been initially funded by AFOSR and then AFRL and then uh, Texas A&M University. Um, and uh, most of the job was done in this building or near that. That's where Aerospace Engineering Department is in Texas A&M. Uh, we have multiple, Texas A&M has multiple campuses and we're always looking for uh, good talents. And by the way, we also have an opening for a faculty position, tenure track uh, in materials and structures in aerospace engineering. So if you're interested, uh, uh, consider that. So, um, I will have the talk in three phases. Uh, the first part is mostly looking through something that doesn't exist yet, all electric aircraft. You'll hear this, this phrase a lot, all electric aircraft. Basically an aircraft that runs on batteries. Um, I'll tell you what the benefits of that is, and I'll tell you what the challenges is. I'm gonna look at some simulations that uh, tries to project how, if we have a very good all-electric aircraft, what percentage of the uh, flights in the United States can be replaced uh, with those? How many, what percentage of conventional aircraft that run on jet fuel can be replaced with all-electric aircraft? Um, there, by the end of this part, hopefully you'll get the message that all-electric aircraft as is without revolution in batteries will have very limited range. Then I'll go into another concept, which is structural energy storage devices. 
I'll briefly go over that, and then I'll finish by some uh, performance analysis of uh, SEDs, structural energy storage devices. Um, I'm not going to go through details uh, in many of these, So, but if you have questions, uh, I'll be more than happy to go through details with you. The contents of this, this presentation is in five journal articles, so um, I'm going to skip some of the details. So, all electric aircraft. Um, this is an uh, NASA's X-57. It's an experimental aircraft. Experimental aircraft means uh, it's an aircraft that doesn't exist. It's an aircraft that all the components have been tested, but there's no flight data on that because it hasn't been flown yet. But the concept of that is an airplane that has distributed thrust along its wings, multiple propellers, and all run and batteries. And um, uh, back in the 2016, urban air mobility was very uh, was uh, a hot topic, and the concept was something like this. So, this was my journey. I from uh, uh, George Bush Airport all the way to uh, Minneapolis. Um, in this flight, uh, we burnt about 11 tons of jet fuel kerosene to generate an obscene amount of energy. And for every kilogram of kerosene we generate, we, we burned, we generated about 3.15 kilograms of CO2. Um, yeah, conservation of mass doesn't hold because all oxygen is coming from the air. Um, and this is one of the greenhouse gases. But in the process, a lot of other gases are also generated, including the water vapor that uh, the contrail you see behind the uh, jet engine, if you look at the jet engine in a, in a clear day, um, and also nitrogen oxides, okay? Um, and altogether, this, these are one of the contributors of greenhouse gases uh, as part of the transportation sector. And transportation sector in general is about uh, the, the, the single largest sector of greenhouse gas emission. Um, what makes the problem uh, more interesting in um, uh, aviation is that unlike ground transportation, all of these gases are, gen are released at cruise altitude. Most of these is released at, as cruise altitude. So they stay in the atmosphere for longer. So if you, for instance, look at this here, kilogram of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of jet fuel, the number you get is far larger than three. It's by, by a factor of two, of two to three. And this is partly because all of this that is released at a high altitude to stay in the high altitude, stay in the atmosphere longer. Now, this is also obviously a function of the time frame because everything is normalized with respect to CO2 and these other gases like contrails and, and uh, 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 nitrogen oxides do not remain in the atmosphere as long as CO2 stays. But even then, you see this factor that is, uh, that is far larger than uh, um, the, C the effect of the CO2 uh, itself. So, the idea was, okay, if we can go to um, all electric transportation or all electric aircraft, one thing we can do is we can eliminate, that's the only approach that can eliminate all the in-flight CO2 emissions, CO2 or CO2 equivalent emissions. Now, that doesn't mean that it will remove, eliminate CO2 emissions because the uh, battery has to be charged some way but that depends on which state you're gonna charge it in and what year it is and what power plants you're, you're using to charge the batteries. But assuming if you're in a state, let's say state of Washington, which is there's uh, lots of hydropower, it's a very clean state in terms of energy production, then you can charge your, um, the batteries of the airplane uh, with uh, very low CO2 production and you're going to release zero CO2 during the flight. So that's one of the advantages. The other advantage of all electric aircraft is the higher efficiency. So energy to thrust efficiency in a, in a conventional aircraft that 
that runs uh, with the jet engine is about six, um, um, I'm sorry, it's about 43% fuel to thrust. But for an electric aircraft, it's going to be 66%. So it's about the factor, it's about the factor of 1.5. So your energy will be uh, better used. And then there is some other aspects such as reliability, because if you, you can have distributed thrusts, let low, fewer moving parts and lower temperatures and all that. And the other aspect is the reduced noise. Um, and these factors will can are very important to the point that they can change the, the way we know uh, 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 aerial uh, transportation, because now you can bring aircrafts or airports closer to the city or closer to the city side. Um, but, okay, so there are some challenges here. So let's say there's, um, there's a flight that goes from A to B. And if you look at the conventional, if you go with a conventional aircraft, um, you are generating six to nine kilograms of CO2 equivalent for every kilogram of, uh, of fuel that you burn. And 0 0.012 megawatt hour of kilogram per kilogram uh, of fuel is the amount of energy you get. And so you divide this to, you're getting about 500 to 750 of a kilogram of CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour of energy that, that you generate. This is if you go with a conventional aircraft, okay? So now, but if you go with an electric aircraft, you go the same route, um, it depends, this number has to be compared with numbers here which is the amount of CO2 equivalent that is released by the power plant uh, in different states. So for instance, let's look at one of the worst, uh, Alaska. Uh, it generates 14, about 1500 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour. So in this state or uh, Alaska, and uh, running it on running electric aircraft uh, uh, will, will not make sense at all because this number is far larger than this number. But then if you look at Washington, it's actually a favorable comparison. <laughs> okay. But this is just a rough comparison. We have to go beyond this. Now, there is another problem but there's another factor that we have to keep in mind when we uh, work with all electric aircraft. And that is the, uh, when you compare the energy density of the jet fuel with energy density of the batteries. Um, it's more than a, uh, uh, an order of magnitude, closer to two orders of magnitude. And this number is a number that industry uses. So it's, it's very reliable. And this number, when I say less than one, the, the number that's used in the industry is closer to about 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So it means if you want to have the same amount of energy in an aircraft, um, you need a lot more batteries, per, a lot more kilograms of batteries than kilograms of, of kerosene. And in aerospace, Weight is bad. Weight is a penalty. So the airplane becomes so heavy that cannot fly. So basically, to consider all of that, um, all of these limitations in, in, into the picture, basically to look at how different electric aircraft would do in different uh, states, and also keep him, and also to look at the disparity between the energy density of a, of a uh, kerosene and energy density of a battery. Um, we started by a study that not, oops, what happened? Okay. We looked at, at a study that not at all did. And um, in their study, they, they um, optimized, um, um, they basically minimized the mass of several uh, electric aircraft based on that were comparable to Airbus 320 in terms of number of pass payload and for different ranges. And they looked at four different battery uh, cases. So this is each of the curves is a uh, energy density of the battery. And look at this, even 800 is, is kind of very high for an energy density of the battery. Basically, uh, this is, these are very futuristic. 
But for instance, what you see here with 800 uh, watt hour per kilogram, uh, let's look at, for instance, this case, or let's look at this case, um, at about 1,000, uh, for a flight range of 1,000 kilometers, the takeoff weight would be in the order of 110 uh, tons. And if you want to increase the flight range at 800, um, you see that the, the, there's a, the flight range scales unfavorably with, with the mass of the airplane. And that's because as you go higher and higher, you actually have to add more and more battery to run itself, to, to charge the airplanes. So basically, and, and so, but obviously when you get better batteries, very futuristic batteries, you can uh, break, you can break this barrier and go to larger ranges. Okay, so we started with this study and uh, we took this for granted. And uh, then we made some modifications to the range predictions. In particular, we made two major changes. First, we assumed that if you put a battery in an airplane, you cannot discharge it all the way to zero. You can only use 90% of the battery. Uh, the 10% have to remain there so that the battery doesn't lose its cyclability. And when I say cyclability, I mean you can charge it over and over again. And the second thing is we looked at FAA regulations and uh, one of the FAA regulations is that the airplane have, has to have one hour reserve of flight range. In other words, if, if the unthinkable happens, airplane can land somewhere and, and nobody gets hurt. When you, when you take these two, and these two put a major restriction on uh, all electric aircraft because already the range is very low. Um, so, and so you end up with, after you do the modifications, you end up with curves like this. So here, let me, um, let me move this away. Okay. So this graph, this graph, is for different years, starting from 220 all the way to 2050. And the way we created this graph is by taking the, the uh, study of not at all, be the study of 2050, because the batteries are futuristic. <laughs> and we walk, we walk backwards, basically reduce the propulsive efficiency of the aircraft by about 1% every year until we get to the uh, to 2020. And then we walk, and then we started from there. So, um, so, for instance, um, in this curve, each line corresponds to one battery architecture. Um, the, the lines that are um, faint are an arbitrary value, and the lines that are darker correspond to a specific uh, uh, battery architecture. The winning one among them is the lithium air battery, which is this case, that is the highest energy density of, uh, of the batteries. And so then with that, we have the flight range as a function of energy consumption. And so because we know the, the mass of the battery that, that was used in each design, <clears throat> then we can calculate the amount of energy that is used in, in each flight or for a particular range. <clears throat> So for instance, uh, let's look at two cases. This is at, at about 1000 kilometers of range. This is the Airbus 320, a conventional aircraft. It, it consumes about uh, eight, um, oops, yeah. It consumes about eight megawatt hours uh, for, for this uh, flight. Whereas a corresponding all electric aircraft <coughs> uh, consumes 44 megawatt hours uh, of energy. It consumes a lot more because batteries are way heavier. What is the same between both these two cases is that they're carrying the same payload and they're carrying the same uh, distance. So basically, and, and, and this is one, one point to be taken away from here is that in aerospace industry, um, the, what they care about is the RPK, revenue passenger kilometer, 
which is the product of the number of passengers flown by the number by the amount of kilometers by the distance in kilometers. So when you keep the kilometer and the payload passengers the same in terms of the industry of aerospace, you're comparing apples with, with apples. Now, so um, when you look at these two numbers, you say, okay, uh, this is uh, far more energy than this, okay? Um, that one may conclude that, okay, then in this case, if you look at all cases, the electric aircraft is always above the conventional aircraft, it's consuming more energy. So then you may conclude that uh, all electric aircraft are never good enough, okay? But not so quickly, because there's some more calculations to be done. What matters um, is we have to compare the amount of emissions of each flight, the amount of CO2 equivalent emission per e for each flight and compare the two. So, <clears throat> so let's look at two other uh, numbers that are important. One is emission intensity, which is kilogram CO2 per, per energy per unit of energy. In an all electric aircraft, this is a function of the state and year. If you're in the state of Washington and 2050, this is gonna be very low because it's hydropower and it's very low emission because it's the, the CO2 emission of the power plant. But if you're in, in Alaska in 2025 or 2023, it's gonna be a very bad state because uh, uh, a lot of emissions, uh, because the power plant generates a lot more emission than uh, the jet fuel. Now, on the other hand, the, the emission intensity of a conventional aircraft is the emission intensity of the fuel plus well to pump, whatever the amount of energy you consume to get the uh, 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 fuel from well all the way to the pump which is very well documented. And this number is not a function of the state. Uh, doesn't matter where you, whether you fill the tank in, in Alaska or in Hawaii or Washington and Minnesota. So emission ratio, which is the amount of CO2 uh, uh, that the uh, all electric aircraft uh, produces over the CO2 that the um, conventional aircraft uh, produces for the same amount of, for the same payload and the same distance would be the ratio of the two energies that we calculated in the previous slide, which is far more than one, uh, unfortunately, it's about four for all electric aircraft, times the emission intensity, which is in some states is going to be more than one, in some states it's going to be less than one. And so you get a product of, of this ratio, which is this, and this ratio, which is that. Now, if this ratio ends up to be more than one, that means replacing conventional aircraft with all electric air aircraft is a bad idea. You will generate, you will produce more CO2 than you're saving. You, you, you will generate more CO2 in the power plant than you would be saving by replacing the uh, conventional aircraft with, the, uh, with all electric aircraft. If it's less than one, then uh, depending on how less, how, how much less than one it is, you would be in a, in a good shape. So now, um, so we looked at with this, um, we calculated basically this ratio for about 10 million flights. Um, that was the year before COVID because of, of, in the year of COVID things changed a lot. And then we projected this all the way from 2022 to 2050. Obviously we assume that the state's uh, uh, emission intensity goes down by about, based on the uh, uh, prediction, based on the uh, past by the same percentage goes down. Um, we looked at um, uh, 10 million flights, 30 years, and here, when you, every time you look at the future, uh, you have to make assumptions about how states will uh, reduce their emission intensity. So we consider two scenarios. One is the what, what I show on the left, and then these two is uh, for a different scenario. What I consider the left as we consider the lower bound is, if you look at um, the whole country, 
every year emission intensity has gone down by about one by about two percent. So we assume that that trend will continue from 2020 to 2050. And as emission intensity goes down, electric aircraft become more and more favorable. In the right scenario, we considered that by 2050, all the energy produced in the United States is from renewables. Okay, that's the Biden policy. Now, you might say it's very uh, 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 unrealistic. Fine, I, I don't, I don't have a problem with, with that. But one thing we can agree is that if this this is the upper bound, this is the lower bound. Okay, so the reality is somewhere between the two. So let's look at some cases. This is the passenger share of all electric aircraft. So, and let's look at the case of lithium air, which is our best case scenario, although you can look at others as well. So up until 2034, almost zero passenger share, but then up, but then from there, batteries become sufficiently good and states become sufficiently green that this share will go up. At 2050, we can have about 20% passenger share. It means 20% of passengers will fly uh, an old electric aircraft. Um, now, the passenger share in the other scenario would go up by about 50%. Okay. Why it doesn't go to 100%? There's one reason, and that is because the batteries become so heavy, or batteries are so heavy that the airplane becomes so heavy that it cannot fly anymore. Okay, so now, but um, what matters is the money for uh, aviation industry. And, and so not, money is not just a passenger share, it's the product of the passenger share and the uh, kilometer, RPK, revenue passenger kilometer. And so in the best case scenario, which is this scenario, the upper bound, the RPK, the best battery, at most can get to 20%. So passenger share is 50%, but RPK can go up to 20%, not higher. And the reason is that longer flights typically have more number of passengers. And so uh, basically it's kind of this to the power of two that you get to that 20%. So, um, bottom line is, okay, um, at best we can go to 20% unless there's a revolution in batteries. And this is just, um, uh, I'll, I'll go through, there's a lot to unpack in this slide, but the only, the main thing I say is that this tells you that places where um, all electric aircraft would be probably most likely to emerge. These are places that A, Airports are very close to, to one another, so routes are not very long. So airplane can be charged and go from A to B. Plus, um, it's uh, the state is very green. Okay, so. Now, okay, but even in those cases, we can go up to 20%. So what? how can you go beyond that? Um, so one is you count on batteries, but as I told you earlier, we have already taken that into account. Unless there's a revolution here, we cannot go beyond batteries, beyond uh, 20%. So then there were some other solutions proposed, such as um, this uh, impulse. Um, um, uh, so basically the idea was that directly wire it to the sun and, and let the guy get charged by uh, solar cells on, on the, on the wing, and um, although it was a very nice concept, but the wing turns out to be very big. And the, the, uh, the I, I think the payload was two people. And um, uh, yeah, so not very realistic. Uh, interesting, but not realistic. Uh, I don't know if they proved the concept or disproved the concept, but I leave it to to your to you to decide. But um, but. I, I don't see it as the, as the future. Okay, so then there was, there was another approach and that's basically how I got into this business. Um, so batteries are very heavy, okay? So, and the blue circle is what, where a battery works or the blue oval actually is where the battery works. It stores energy. Now, imagine you have another material that not does not just 
energy storage, but does this other function, function X, a multifunctional material. Uh, so a structural energy store, so I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. A, a material that can store energy, but can also do something else that an earthquake needs, okay? So if, if that is the case, then, then you have a material that um, basically you can get into the quote unquote, a zero mass battery. You count part of the airplane that is not commonly used for energy storage for energy storage, okay? Now, how far that, uh, um, how far that can go in order to answer that, first we have to see what that other function could be. And, um, you know, um, so function two is energy storage. Now one or two doesn't really mean any uh, order of significance, but one of the functions in, is energy storage. The other function is something. What is that something? I would argue with you that this other something could be, this other function could be load bearing. In other words, you can have load bearing structures that store energy at the same time. And I argue for that from both systems level, uh, uh, I'll present a systems level argument, but also a materials level argument. For systems level argument, oops, for systems level argument, the, the airframe, the load bearing uh, parts of an airplane are one of the largest masses of an airplane. So if I can turn them into a multifunctional material, then um, it's a lot of the mass that can be used for energy storage. But for also from a materials perspective, um, if you look at um, a, an uh, aerospace composite, it's carbon fibers with um, a polymer matrix. Now, the carbon fibers are conductive, A, electronically conductive, but B, um, B they are um, the same material as, they're pretty much made, <clears throat> made of graphite, which is the electrode of a lithium ion battery. So if I can turn the polymer into a solid electrolyte polymer, that can serve both as the electrolyte of the battery and also, or uh, electrolyte of the energy storage device and also as the um, matrix of the composite, then uh, I can make my case. Um, so an example of this material would be something like this. Um, it's a layered structure that has fibers as electrodes here, there's a separator that can, uh, separates the anode from the cathode. Uh, there would be some current collectors at the both ends, and you can use that as the fuselage, as the as the skin, as the wing, and, and all that. Um, this idea of of using, by the way, using um, uh, composites as energy storage or uh, structural energy storage devices. It's not, we're not the first to propose that, but there has been other cases in the literature. And the, the, the energy storage mechanisms are either as a battery or as a supercapacitor. So if it's as a battery, the ions, let's say in this case, lithium ion battery, the lithium ions will intercalate in between the layers of the graphite the structure of the carbon fiber, for instance. If it's a supercapacitor, all the ions are stored on the surface of the electrodes. So, but then two questions remain. Um, I have one material with one microstructure. One, I cannot change the microstructure in real time. So I can just set it one way. And the question is, if I optimize it for energy storage, how does my load bearing performance be and the other way around? And is there a, a, a favorable trade-off between them? And the last question I will answer is, um, how does uh, structural energy storage devices perform in different climates? <laughs> so the first question, can a material be good both as load bearing and energy storage devices? 
And in order to answer that question, we started working with uh, structural supercapacitors. So just a, a, a brief introduction to supercapacitors. You probably know the um, uh, a parallel plate capacitor. So two conductive layers separated by dielectric material and the energy is proportional to the capacitance times the voltage difference between the two to the power of two. And this capacitance is proportional to the surface area of the electrodes and inversely proportional to the distance between the electrodes. So if you wanna maximize the energy storage, what you have to do is you have to maximize the surface area and you have to minimize the distance between the two electrodes. And that's when it comes to minimizing the distance between the two electrodes, that's where the concept of uh, electric double layer comes into picture. So if you have a charged surface, let's say the surface of a carbon fiber or a carbon nanofiber, and um, it's next to an electrolyte, on the surface of the electrolyte, you will form two layers of parallel charges. These, <clears throat> the thickness of this layer is basically uh, uh, comparable to the interspacing between atoms. So it's, it's the thinnest D you can get. But then if you wanna maximize the area, you go to some approach like this, you add porosity, because every time you add porosity to a structure, you add the free surface to the structure, okay? So if you wanna make a good supercapacitor for energy storage, you have to increase the surface area, you have to introduce porosity. But that's get when, things, when things become a little bit nasty because when you introduce porosity to a fiber to, to store energy in it in a double layer, uh, porosity is a bad thing for energy, for load bearing. You will have the stress concentrations around the holes. And that is where you can see trade off between load bearing and energy storage. Okay. So we tried to address this problem experimentally. And the way we did that with, um, and I'll go briefly over it, is uh, we looked at carbon fiber, carbon nanofiber yarns with, uh, with solid electrolytes. Um, and um, we modified the structure of the carbon nanofiber yarns and uh, studied how, studied the trade off between energy storage and load bed. So, we looked at four different architectures of, of carbon nanofibers. What you see on the first, side, first uh, plot on the top left is basically carbon fiber yarns that are porous. The way we make them porous is basically, this is a cross section of a, of a fiber. It has a porosity in the middle of it, and then there are these other porosities. The way we make, these, uh, make them is by adding some uh, it, it's through a process that's called pyrolysis. So you have two polymers here. One of them is a sacrificial polymer, it's PLMA. The other one is a polyacrylonitra. And uh, you mix them, you spin them into fibers, and then you heat them up. When you heat them up very to sufficiently high temperatures, PMMA first go, goes away, you get some pores and pan converts into carbon. So you get a specific surface area of 30 to 50 meters squared per gram of the material. Um, in the next step, we, we etch the material a little bit to make, to activate them. This is what we call the activated carbon fiber yarns. Here, surface area goes up considerably. In the third step, we add in, in so this is sample one, sample two, sample three is when it gets sampled to and you add cobalt oxide to it. The purpose of the cobalt oxide is to add some chemical reactions for energy storage. You will see the effect of that later. And then the last step is to, we take this guy and we dope it with nitrogen and that's to increase conductivity. Okay. And so we took all four and uh, uh, we studied the um, energy storage in, in the uh, supercapacitors that we made with them. And the uh, energy storage was, was measured with, C, uh, with cyclic voltometry. You apply a voltage, a cyclic voltage like this, and you study the current as a function of, of uh, time. 
And if you're making a supercapacitor or you're making a, a capacitor, you will get a behavior like this or like this. There's an area, there's a hysteresis, which is the energy that's stored in the guide. We also study the mechanical properties of this because don't forget, we want to see if there's a trade off between energy storage and load bearing. So um, these are the first the studies of the energy storage. The, the, this one, the one in the middle, is the case of the uh, porous carbon fiber yarns. There's basically almost zero energy storage. When you activate it, you get an improved energy storage, and that's because you add a lot of surface area along which, on which ions can be stored. When you add cobalt oxide, you get the behavior because of the chemical redox reaction of the cobalt oxide that can store energy. And then when you dope it, you get even higher uh, energy storage because of uh, improved conductivity. So um, if you compare the numbers at the beginning, there was 37, then we could increase it by a factor of four, then we could increase it with another factor of three, then we could increase it by another factor of 1.5. So compared to the beginning material, we could increase the energy storage by 20 times, okay? Then we looked at the then we looked at the strength. Okay. Um, as expected, the initial material has a strength of about 300 megapascal. And when you add the pores by activation, strength drops by about 31%. And when you um, add the uh, cobalt oxide, the strength drops by another 53%. And when you dope it, the strength drops by another, by 70% compared to the initial uh, material. And here, the drop of the strength in, in here by adding cobalt is because the cobalt ions go in between the layers of carbon atoms. And so they increase residual strength in the material. And here, doping reduces the strength because nitrogen replaces carbon atoms. So, at the end, you get uh, a curve like this. Specific energy storage as a function of a strength. And as expected, you are getting a trade-off. So if you want to increase the energy storage, you have to reduce the strength. Um, however, when you look at all the numbers together, um, we, can in, we can increase the energy. Uh, so if you, you go back here. So we, if you compare this case, for instance, we can have 13 times improvement in energy storage, and whereas we have a loss of 50% in strength. So strength goes up by a factor of two, but energy storage goes up by a factor of 13. So it seems that there is some, thing, some tunability that can be done to minimize the loss in the strength while we increase the energy storage. Now, um, is this going to be enough for all electric aircraft? This is a topic of future this, uh, research that, that uh, we have to see. And um, at this point, I'm going to go to the last part of the talk, and that is um, uh, I look at the uh, simulations of uh, the structural energy storage devices in an airplane. So the idea is that you're going to replace some of these panels with the structural energy storage devices, okay? And these are structural energy storage devices will have solid electrolyte as the matrix and uh, carbon fibers or nanofibers as the fiber reinforcement. Now, imagine you're um, um, in a hot, in a, day, in a good day, in a uh, summer day or, well, not summer in Texas, but, mm -hmm. Maybe summer here, and it's uh, uh, it's temperatures. It's not bad, but then uh, when you go to cruise altitude, it's it's very bad. Okay, it's minus. So, uh, guys, I'm not a Fahrenheit, so let me tell you in C. So it's uh, in in Texas, it's forty C, and then you go to cruise altitude, it's minus forty C. So it's it's a eighty degree change in 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 temperature, in a bad direction. Now, why is that a problem? Hopefully it will change the slide and I'll tell you why it's the problem. Okay, 
Uh, this is the conductivity of electrolytes. This is the liquid electrolyte as a function of temperature. This is what you see in a, a normal lithium ion battery. But if you look at the solid electrolyte between minus 40 and 40, conductivity drops by a factor of by six orders of magnitude, by, by five orders of magnitude. Why is that a bad thing? Well, because if your resistivity is very high, all the energy of the battery will go to heat itself up. Okay. So now the other reason that it's very bad is because if you put um, SEDs here or here, they're not just exposed to minus 40 C, they're also exposed to heat convection at very high velocity. And so you're losing heat very quickly on the surface. And not because we don't have the uh, permission to fly an airplane like this, so we had to model it. Um, and what we modeled was a panel of an SED that, that looks like this. Basically, you have layers of carbon nanofibers and liquid and solid electrolyte with uh, insulation on the two ends, uh, which also are current collectors. And we looked at the heat transfer in this material. And so this could be the skin of this, either of the two surfaces, could be the wing or fuselage surface. And if it's the wing, both surfaces will, can be the, the uh, exterior surfaces. If it's a fuselage, one surface could be where the passenger is. And the other surface is the uh, exterior of the uh, fiber. So, and what you do is basically you uh, solve the heat transfer equation in, in, in this uh, problem. It's a transient heat transfer problem with heat that is generated by the current that goes through the battery, okay? And the problem is if the battery resistivity is very high, if you wanna get any uh, sizable J current from the battery, you'll have to generate a lot of heat in the battery, okay? Now this is maybe a problem, maybe not a problem. So let's look at that. So um, we, we modeled the battery as two layers. Um, each of them is a composite and we have the fibers and as the electrodes and we have a solid electrolyte here. Uh, we took the material properties from the literature and eventually, as I will show you later, we calculated a multifunctional efficiency of this uh, composite. This multifunctional efficiency, let me explain to you what this is. So. If you have a structural, so the multifunctional efficiency is the sum of the structural efficiency and device efficiency. Device here means energy efficiency. So when, uh, the uh, structural efficiency is the ratio of the performance of the uh, composite, the structural performance, in this case, we took elastic modulus or stiffness, over the stiffness of a material that is known in, in uh, aerospace industry, such as aluminum. And for uh, device efficiency, we, we said it's the, it's the equal contribution from energy densities and power density. Energy density of the uh, structural battery composite over a reference material, which is uh, the um, lithium ion battery, and the power of the SPC, this is a mistake, the power of the SPC over the uh, power of a reference material, which is the uh, lithium ion battery again. Okay, so for the um, heat convection, forced convection, basically all our calculations were based on a combination of Ray Reynolds numbers and Reynolds number and Tantal number. Uh, which are uh, a Reynolds number represents the basically the velocity, air velocity. And um, we have to solve this problem numerically because the material properties such as conductivity is a high is highly dependent on the temperature. Uh, and so we use the finite difference method. We assume the 1D heat flow through the thickness basically, because it's high aspect ratio composite. And we looked at three cases. The first case here 
is um, the first case is the wind. So you have convection on both sides, but free convection. The second case is the fuselage. So one side is exposed to the cold temperature of the outside. The, the other side is exposed to 20 C, the interior temperature of an airplane. And for case two, we considered a variation of that case three, which is where um, we have heat convection, heat loss as well. So I'm gonna go quickly uh, through the results. When we, when we saw the results, we were a little bit puzzled because you see the, rep, so if you look at the specific power efficiency as a function of external temperatures, the worst case scenario is about 0.7. And this is for different insulation thicknesses. We were surprised by that because this case corresponds to a conductivity of 10 to the power minus five Siemens per meter. And this case corresponds to the conductivity of uh, uh, 10,000 times higher conductivity. And this is, we have convection on both sides. But this, this is averaged over the whole cycle. That is when we, when we looked at the data, we realized what was happening. So on the top, you see the case where the external temperature is 60 degrees C. And on the bottom, you see the case where the external temperature is minus 40 C. So a very cold winter or cruise altitude and, and let's say very hot day. So, um, and so here's the interesting result we saw. Look at the graph shows the variation of the temperature as a function of time. This axis is time. This is through the thickness, but there's not much variation in the thickness as a function of time. And here's this function of time. Here, the temperature goes up by about six degrees. Here, the temperature of the battery goes up by about 80 degrees. The reason it happens is because in this case, the initial resistance of the battery is very high, but the battery will use most of its energy to power up itself, to increase its own energy, and when, the, when the, its own temperature. And when the temperature goes up, these two become more or less the same thing. Uh, so that's what we call self-regulating of the temperature in, in solid uh, composite batteries. Now, you see very similar behavior in cases uh, in case two as well. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through it. But let me go to case three. For the sake of time, go to case three. Here is, um, let's look at these two first. One of them is the wing, and the other one is the cabin, both, both with, with forced convection. The interesting thing is that in the case of a wing, you still see the power efficiency goes up because battery heats up itself, but it doesn't go up uh, above 40%. Uh, for the fuselage, it goes higher, or cabin, it goes higher because only on one side you have convection. Um, however, it's very low. So we decided to add um, uh, a preheating. So we change, uh, this is where the, the external temperature is minus 40 C. We preheated that. And we realized that actually um, preheating works to some extent, especially for the initial phase of the flight. So in, it increases the average efficiency of the battery, but it's not a necessary component um, uh, for, especially for the fuse. Um, for the for the hot climate, you don't need that, so I'm going to skip that, and I'm going to end uh, with this. So structural battery composites, if you calculate the multifunctional efficiency of them, uh, the structural component, the energy, and the power, uh, you can get multifunctional efficiency that's larger than one. This corresponds to weight saving of an airplane. So you can reduce the weight of an airplane by about 15%, 15 to 17% by switching to multifunctional uh, batteries. Um, however, more work needs to be done because we haven't looked at how cyclability of, of these batteries will, will change things. And obviously we haven't looked at uh, FAA regulations. So, and this is my last slide. Uh, the way we think structural energy storage can come into picture 
is uh, when I prepared this slide, we were here, we had batteries that only store energy. Um, then later on, uh, we realized that um, Tesla is actually improving crash worthiness of the batteries by relying on the uh, energy, uh, uh, load bearing capacity of the batteries. But in the near future, you can have cases where you have a structural energy storage devices in vehicles that are not life threatening uh, such as a drone of an Amazon that will de deliver things. In a more distant future, you can have a structural energy storage devices in secondary load bearing components. In, in, in parts of the vehicle that if they fail, airplane can still land, can still, everyone can still survive. And in the last phase, actually this is, uh, I took this from uh, the late ASP group in, in Sweden. Uh, eventually you can have this uh, in the load bearing components of an airplane. So I'm gonna uh, finish with, uh, with uh, I, I'll just leave it here. These are the list of publications that I uh, uh, present results from. If you have any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you very much for a uh, very exciting and interesting talk. Thank you. Um, so, any questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, can, can you speak louder? Yeah, sure. Uh, I do not understand why different states have different emission intensities. Oh, oh so, so think about it this way. Let's say I have an old electric aircraft, okay? I want to compare it to a conventional aircraft that burns, that generates 700 uh, kilograms of CO2 per every megawatt hour, per, ev per every kilowatt hour, per, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, per every megawatt hour of energy that it produces. If I charge that electric aircraft in Hawaii, the power plant in Hawaii generates more pollution than that by a factor of three, probably. By a factor of two, sorry. So that's a bad idea. So I will generate more CO2 if I use my own electric aircraft in Hawaii. But if I use it in the state of Washington, uh, there it's about 137. So it's 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 much, very much to my favor. So are you creating this for specific states? Yes. You're constrained to certain regions. We 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 study that for every state. And for um, this this paper is uh, which one is that? This guy, you know, this guy um, has about I think fifty pages on his side because we looked at every state for thirty years. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I was curious if you go back to the map with like the potential flight routes on it. Uh -huh. Um, it looks a lot to me, or it reminds me of maps I've seen for like potential high-speed rail buildouts. Have you like looked at comparing like the infrastructure buildout that this would represent compared to like other technologies? Um, I I haven't. Okay, but th that's actually a very good uh, suggestion. Uh, okay, there are two things that uh, determine these. One is the the first question that I answered. So if <clears throat> if you're in a bad state, forget about it. Or, or I shouldn't say that. If you're in a state that, um, <laughs> what, is, what is the right word? If you're in a state that um, that that doesn't have much renewables, forget about it. Okay, that's that's one thing. But the other thing is the proximity of the two des the destination, the two the origin and destination. So, for instance, Texas, we have a lot of renewables, but unfortunately, the cities are far away. But in Washington, both of two criteria are met. So they're very close. Now, I suspect, I suspect, although I, I don't have any reasons yet to, to say that, I suspect uh, the reason the two look the same is potentially because of the proximity of the, of the two uh, cities and the number of people that will uh, travel between them. I think that would be the reason. I cannot imagine why, uh, Pollution would be a factor in their design. Yes. How about hydrogen fuel cell instead of batteries? Um, 
So we, we haven't looked at that. So one, one solution obviously is, is, um, is that, but for, for the case of hydrogen fuel cells, one challenge is, as far as I know, they still generate the CO2, but they still generate the greenhouse gases because they, they, they're gonna dump the water that they take from the, during the reaction process. So it's not gonna solve that problem uh, completely. Okay. Uh, but, but to be honest, we haven't looked at that. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I'm interested in the, the, the part uh, about the cell. So uh, just a clarification question. Do you mean the cell heating is very efficient? The convection is not very efficient. So the cell- Say, say that again, say that again. Self heating yes, is self very efficient, and the, the convection is not very efficient based on your calculation. So, uh, self heat heating is definitely very good. It it uh, so um, yes, I agree to that. Uh, so let me go here. The the clear graph is here. That yeah. if you look at these two. One is at a very high outside temperature, which is very good for the battery. One is at a terrible temperature for the battery. Mm -hmm. Below this, it's kind of unimaginable to use the, the batteries. But both of them uh, give us very close overall efficiency. At the beginning, efficiency of this guy is very bad because it's heating itself. But overall efficiency, how much of the total energy is used to for external load, both of them uh, become very close, and that's because of that self regulating Okay, so now your other question is uh, adding convection. How? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. So convection is very bad for when you have two things. Uh, both this guy, the wing, that both sides is exposed, and uh, especially without any preheating. I mean, preheating. To be honest, it's not a major factor because if the flight goes above only not three thousand seconds, you know, they, and this is where we modeled the whole takeoff plan and cruise and landing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you go beyond here, preheating doesn't matter. But but, but the major difference between uh, these two and these two is heating from uh, cooling from two sides versus cooling from one side. And keep in mind. When you keep the temperature of the inside at 20 C, you're actually con constantly heating the battery because the exterior is minus 40 C. How about the energy consumption of that part? Is that, um, so you maintain the- No, no, we haven't taken that into account. So yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, just uh, one last question. Uh, I guess what first come, came to mind when you started talking about these dual purpose materials is like the spacecraft applications. Have you looked at modeling if these could work in like satellites or something where the weight constraint is a huge yes, part of the yes. construction? No, we haven't. Um, I'm trying to see why we didn't look at that. I don't have an answer for that. I think that would be actually something cool. Thank you. <laughs> Can I ask a question on the other end of the spectrum? So spacecrafts um, are really high and expensive. Yes. How far can you extend this idea in the other direction? So as in like as small as phones or like good, good, excellent. So let me go back to this slide. Um, so one thing I like about this approach is it's um, an increasing level of risk and increasing level of complexity. So yeah. as you're increasing, because at every step, you're, you're gonna manage, you're gonna assess the risk. And so as you go to the next step, you're gonna address them. Either it's a go or no go. If it's a go with some modifications or it's a no go, okay, that could be the case. But uh, I think probably part of the answers would be some somewhere here where I see we can have many of them. And if the guy can go, two houses, two extra houses on one charge, that's that's a huge gain. So I, I was wondering, so your strategy to in, increase the capacity was uh, to play with this uh, surface there, uh, but there is also the 
the epsilon term. So I was wondering if it's realistic to maybe work in the material space at all with the polymers to increase the I, I would concept. say probably not. The reason is that when you look at the supercapacitor, and I'm not a chemist, so my answer could be wrong. Okay, so I have chemists who worked with, with us on that. Probably not, because keep in mind, when you want to change epsilon, you want to add another material. Change it, yeah. That material has to have the thickness of interest comparable to interspacing between atoms, because that's the thickness of an electric double lane. So you may increase this, but if you also increase this, let's say by putting the thinnest layer of a polymer, let's say 10 nanometer thin layer, right now this distance is below one nanometer in a supercapacitor. But, but the epsilon doesn't refer to the hull, to the bulk, or it refers just to this layer? Or? It, it, I think it refers to the layer, yes. Uh, unless my understanding of supercapacitors is not uh, correct. But, but. Uh, I think it, that that is the case. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So uh, finally, you showed the uh, one point one five to one yes, point yes, uh, something. Yes. So I, I just want to know if you translate that to the the number, like uh, how much percentage of uh, L line can be replaced by O electric? How much that will enhance? Uh, uh, okay. We we have it. Okay, but there's an easy way to do it. This the uh, this fifteen percent is very uh, this minus one, which is fifteen percent. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's the amount of mass saving you can have. Okay, mm -hmm. so you're not going to save the mass. You're going to load it up with batteries. Okay, so you know the battery, and so you know what battery architecture you're adding. You know the mass because you know the total mass of your airframe. So then from there, you can calculate the extra energy you have on board. And from there, you can calculate the extra range you can go. So um, uh, I, we haven't done that, but that's how I would go sure. about it. Well, when you talk about supercapacitors and batteries, it seems to me batteries are for energy density and supercapacitors are for power density. Are you using it, finding to use them in a complementary way? So, um, um, so far, uh, what we have done for the modeling to be used as bat at batteries because they have more energy density. But for the experiments, we looked at uh, supercapacitors. The main reason we looked at supercapacitors was um, if you, because the cyclability in supercapacitors is much better. You can cycle them 10,000 times and uh, they won't budge. But batteries are not like that. So we need to learn a lot more about batteries before we can uh, use them in an airplane. Uh, can you also comment on how this might apply to the hybrid uh, electric? Good question. Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't know. Um, after our discussion, I talked about hybrids, and uh, there are so many things in the air about hybrids. Uh, like, um, you can um, you can always use them to extend the range of, of your uh, battery. So. In that sense, it, it applies there. But the question is, what are, but, but then the answer, part of the answer depends on what architecture of uh, hybrid oh, we're looking at, you know? And that's the part I'm not really, I'm, I'm very unclear about. Because especially I talked to some folks who are much more familiar with FAA regulations. And some of the hybrid concepts are, I don't see how FAA would ever approve of them. You know, uh, it's a very conservative industry for, for very good reasons, conservative industry. You know? uh, that's why there's very few accidents, you know, so. Can you recycle these materials? Uh, or the cycles are starting? Technically, yes. And I have worked on recycling carbon fibers, uh, but in aerospace, almost never recycled material is used. 
because um, uh, because everything has to go through a lot of certifications and everything is prices exaggerated by it compared to let's say same material that is used in wind energy you know? uh, so yeah but technically they can the fiber all right so uh, well thank you very much let's move to the game You didn't sign up for a uh, uh, class this time. Are you involved in the uh, uh, industrial engineers? Uh, I think I'm going to ask. I've had a few yeah. yeah. uh, yeah, I was like, yeah. 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 it sounds really interesting. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, it seems that when when the graduates are working in the NASA, we do just uh, we have to work out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y